Welcome to In Focus, where we delve into the life and career of activist, entrepreneur and politician Jenny Wise Power. This project began life as a panel discussion for the 2020 festival, but like so many things in this past year, it was postponed and moved online. So, in true lockdown style, I sat down for a Zoom chat with three of Ireland's leading feminist historians to discuss this fascinating life story. Dr Margaret Ward is Honorary Senior Lecturer in History at Queen's University, Belfast. Dr Mary McAuliffe, Assistant Professor and Lecturer in Gender Studies at UCD. And Dr Sinead McCool, author and curator at the Jackie Clark Collection in Mayo. All three women have written extensively about this period and have been involved in many of the events of the Decade of Centenaries. Obviously, the setting up of Coming On was was a an intense series of negotiations, uh, particularly after the founding of the Irish Volunteers in, in November 1913 and women not being allowed to join. Although a few women do say they did join, but obviously um, that wasn't going to be encouraged. So women like Jenny Weisbauer and Kathleen Clark and others wanted to set up an organisation for women who were, were committed to uh, the cause for our uh, fight for Irish freedom or the cause of Irish freedom, um, the organization or a standalone, um, you know, attached to the Irish volunteers or a standalone independent organization, how they were going to set it up, who were going to be, on, who was going to be on the executive. And of course, Jenny's um, uh, advice on, on this was, was uh, really sought out and, and very uh, impactful in how they actually ended up establishing uh, come and on. And of course, from the very outset, it was quite successful. Like they, their first meeting, four o'clock in the afternoon um, in, in Wynn's Hotel, uh, they didn't think four, 30 or 40 people would turn up or women, or more than 100, I think, turned mm-hmm. up on that day. They were a self-elected uh, executive, um, chosen, I would say, um, from, you know, if you look at the names, chosen to sort of appeal to that centre ground. So nobody's going to be alienated, although we do see those discussions between the nationalist women who supported suffrage and the suffrage women who might have, may or may not have supported nationalism, whether suffrage should come first or, or, or uh, the you know, the cause of Ireland should come first. Um, but I think... With somebody like Jenny Wise Power as a guiding hand, a uh, principled but steady, and and obviously uh, we can see from her involvement in organisations from the time of the Land League, well able to organise, and that's very important as well. These women were well able to organise. They were well able to uh, get meetings together to get pro- uh, information out there. Once the organisation is set up, then to start expanding throughout the country. And that doesn't come automatically. That has to be mentored into the younger women who are getting involved in, in organizations like Common Amon. So you see then uh, the importance of having senior members like Jenny Wise Power, who has now several decades of organization under her belt and of successful organization and involvement in political activism with its divisions and discussions and debates and and uh, grassroots activism um, and that really helps coming among particularly when you see the the suffered women and the nationalist women having these arguments and debates in the newspapers about what coming among is and what it should be and i mean the, the suffrage women were quite dismissive in some ways of coming them on. And yet they, at the same time, were able to have those. And I think it shows those discussions. It shows a certain maturity in women's political organization and activism at this time, for which we can thank, you know, women like Jenny Weisspower, who are bringing that organizational skill maturity uh, into uh, women's organizations. You know, when, when you think of where she was, where she was located, right in the heart of, of Dublin, um, the volunteers had met in her house uh, at the beginning of the week. Um, that, that's the volunteers itself. And then they have the other meeting where Tom Clark, who wasn't on the volunteer executive, comes. And that's the, the, the time that they, they signed the proclamation. So she knows all of that. Her daughter, Nancy, is a messenger 
at, at the period just before the rising. Constance Markievicz stays in her house for the week before the rising until the Easter Sunday, where she goes off and Kathleen, Clark, Kathleen Lynn comes and takes Markievicz's bed for that night. So she's absolutely at the heart of it. And Nancy says when she comes back after having taken the messages, she goes to the GPO to volunteer and they say to her, just go home first and let them know that you're safe. And she goes back, sees the house all barricaded up, um, because you know there's, there's looting, there's 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 the gunfire, there's everything else, and her parents are saying that they're going then to Walter Cole's house. But the following day, her mother comes back. They go back into the restaurant. They take all of that food out and they take it to the GPO. So and they and and Nancy says what they do is they go through the houses where the walls had all had holes in so that they could come in safely from there. And before that, um, I think on on the the Tuesday, Frank G. Skeffington had called in on her on his way home at his ill-fated uh, last journey, and she had come in and said, "Come and have a meal before you go," because he'd had a walk all the way back home to Rath Mines. But he also goes out to the chemist to get medicine for her daughter, Maura. Now remember, Maura is very oh, yeah. ill at this time and dies in July, only mm -hmm. a few months later. So Jenny is coping with a seriously ill daughter with a, a home and a business, uh, just a stone's throw away from the headquarters of the GPO. Her daughter's active uh, and she's still thinking about how to feed those who are in the GPO. I think that she is absolutely heroic and valiant throughout yeah. that time. She's absolutely there. She's doing what she needs to be doing. Um, you know, uh, the, the GPO garrison needs to be fed as much as it needs to be um, reinforced with, with bodies. And that, and that sort of part of it is as important. Uh, and imagine the streets she's walking through to take the, the food and um, then coming back and looking after her sick daughter. I mean, uh, and also at this stage, she's she's older. And also the maintaining of a business and the way that, that they um, that they knew that by where the, the, the rebellion was located, that their business, business met, was now at an end. And so these people are, are, are living on their wits. And I think that, um, you know, they, they become resilient and they get back on their feet and they don't go under with all of their personal tragedies and their own personal mm -hmm. lives. And I think that's very important for people to understand that when we when we come as historians to say we admire somebody, we think they're heroic. We're not using words just for the sake of it. We're seeing them in the round and seeing them as, as, as fully rounded people. H Hannah says that when uh, at Moore's funeral, Jenny said, for I've died many times, and, and Hannah said, because she'd had other tragedies in her life. And you, you do need to remember that. As you say, she does that, but she picks herself up. She's resilient and she keeps going. The women are so important in those years after the rising, particularly late 1916 through 1917 and 18, while a lot of the male leadership was in prison or on the run, um, and they are very much part of that wave of rebuilding, reorganization, but also I think very importantly, um, you know, the fundraising for the prisoners' dependence fund, all that sort of thing, that's vital for helping um, those the, the dependents of the executed signatories and uh, of those who are in prison, but also for reorganizing and, and, and refunding many of these organizations. Uh, and you see Kathleen Clark, who's just had a, a husband and a brother executed and herself had had a miscarriage. And again, that shows the resilience of these women at this time. I mean, Sinead has written about this in, in her, her Easter Widows book uh, about the, the, the amazing resilience of so many of these women. And, and some of them did go under, a few of them aren't, uh, you know, they, and, and you don't blame them for that either, because this is a horrendous time and a horrendous situation many of them find themselves in. But Jenny is one of those resilient women who just picks herself up and, and keeps on going. And when you think about it, she knew all of the um, signatories who were executed. She, loads of her friends were in prison, uh, women friends and male friends. Uh, she buries her daughter in, in July, and yet she continues on working.
for the causes she believes in. Uh, and like many of the women, she's very much uh, engaged in um, propaganda work as well of, of, you know, constructing that ideology of Easter 1916 and the Patriot dead. Because, of course, Irish people aren't immediately uh, militant Republicans because 1916 has happened and, and the signatories have been executed. This all is a very slow process of changing, of greening, the greening of Ireland, I suppose, in many ways. And the women are very, very central to that, particularly um, the Easter widows and particularly the women who are involved in the, the various organi funding organisations, collection organisations. And of course, then the, the important thing that happens in 1918 is the women get the vote. Well, uh, certain women get the vote over the age of 30 with property qualifications. And you have the 1918 election. Um, like you have many other things in between Law and Amman, uh, other, um, um, the, the Republican women's tour that's going on in America. Um, and But Jenny is very much involved in that 1918 general election campaign, of course, for the election of her friend and comrade, Countess Markievicz. And all women like Jenny throw their energies behind the election of Markievicz. I mean, they, they all wanted so many other women to be selected to run in the general election, but it didn't happen. And, and here you see the tensions of with political women. Margaret of Women had mentioned the League of Women Delegates and that, that sort of tension in Sinn Féin, despite the fact that there are women on the executive, uh, they don't manage to get uh, more than two women run in the 1918 uh, general election with Markovic in Dublin and, and Winifred Carney in Belfast. Um, but the one who has the chance is, is Markovic, even though she's in prison. So you have women like Jenny um, running her campaign in absentia for her and making the speeches and, and getting the vote out and making sure that the new women voters are, are registered and can, can get out to vote. Um, encouraging, you know, uh, Sinn Féin are doing a big campaign to, you know, vote him in to get him out because most of the um, candidates are in jail, but also Markovic is in jail. So they are representing her and they pull it off. They get her elected mm -hmm. in the St. Patrick's division and, and kudos to them and the organizational ability again of women like Jenny Wise Power. It's interesting because Nancy heads up the election campaign and there's that kind of correspondence between Nancy and Meg Connery of the Franchise League because feminists don't think quite rightly, don't think Sinn Féin are doing enough and Sinn Féin are not doing enough. And they're not. No. Women candidates, it's the women who come together and make sure. And, and also uh, it's coming a man who goes up to Belfast and supports Winifred Carney rather than Sinn Féin. But it's interesting, you know, Kathleen Clark wanted to be a candidate. Hannah Shee Skeffington wanted to be a candidate. Various names are banded around. They're not, uh, they're not selected. But Jenny Wise Power is never a name that I hear. No, that's true. Would. And I think and she, she, would, she, would thought she would have been a, a, a really obvious candidate for Sinn Féin to have put forward. Sorry, just to say that she wrote herself, um, you know, that that she that, you know, about her electioneering, what Mary described there, that she she was because Markovic was in prison. She was at she was on the podium and she was on the platform getting those votes for for Markovic. And I think that might have been a reason that she may have taken that decision because of the fact that that she knew that there was a potential to get somebody over the line. So I think it was I think she was behind that. And obviously, with Nancy being central to it, those two women, you know, are there at that moment. When we think about the, the election in 18, we're often, you know, seeing it from the perspective of Ireland and the fact that the, um, you know, of the, you know, the fact that they had decided that they were not going to, um, you know, not like they're not support the parliament and they were going to set up an alternative parliament mm -hmm. in Ireland. But what, what I think is really, really interesting is that when you think about the suffrage movement and those militant and those those active women in England and Wales and Scotland, that when the 17 women stood, it's an Irish woman that's elected mm -hmm. in that for, for Ireland, again, born in London, Buckingham Gate, but, uh, but grew up in Ireland. Um, but I think what's really important then is that you think about that, that, that juggernaut of political activism that had been in the run up to that election and it still did not bring women over the line. Then you look back at what Jenny Wise Power and others did in their 
their ability to to bring in that that the, 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 those votes at that time while having opposition from the males of the Sinn Féin movement who didn't want um, you know women elected and 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 Margaret has really examined that that the work of the the League of Women Delegates in in her uh, work many years ago in in in, in History of Ireland and is still a standout article of, about that idea that there was this you know this real um, uh, action on the part of the, the men returning from prison to stop the women having these roles so so it, it it's it's I think what, what where we feel in terms of this and this reclaiming of Jenny Wise power is that it's she's representative of so many others, uh, you know, who were being prevented from maybe having their full potential at this period. Women were central as well to the anti-conscription campaigns. Mm-hmm. Um, and they had been involved with the you know the main campaign uh, in April of of uh, 1918, uh, but they themselves then organised the Great Law on the Mon. June the 8th, um, 1918, where they get out uh, and get the signatures of uh, tens of thousands of Irish women against conscription uh, and against recruitment into the British Army. And again, it shows the organisational ability of coming them on. Uh, and that comes from the training, I suppose, and mentorship. And now you have an awful lot of the women who joined coming them on as younger women in 1914, are really flowering into the great organisers that they're going to be throughout the War of Independence, um, as well as still having the expertise of, of people like Jenny um, at this stage. And, and they're really, you can see them, they can do it. When they put their minds to it, they, they can get a huge organisation, huge numbers out uh, to sign petitions or to uh, during the war of independence they will be uh, coming out in great numbers outside of prisons for example when they're campaigning against the execution of of imprisoned republicans Um, and you see that organizational ability that has been ingrained into the the coming on organization from the beginning from 1914. yeah those women the first women that, that 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 were active from the very early stages are now the ones who go out and help to organise the new branches. So, for example, Nancy Wise Power goes up to Belfast and she's there for six months or so because Belfast is very weak after 1916. Um, you know, you, so you can see that they've, they put their most experienced people very strategically. So you can see that they're sitting and they're, they're having these kind of meetings from the centre and, and working out what, what they're doing next. It's absolutely fascinating. But Jenny is very much, it, she seems to be a linchpin in terms of the women who are imprisoned in Holloway. So, you know, Hannah's only there a, a few days in Holloway, but the first thing she does when she comes out almost is to write a really long letter to Jenny to talk about what the conditions of Markovich, Kathleen Clark and Maud Garner because the women themselves can't get that information out Mm -hmm. and we know this from Jenny's letter back to Hannah saying your goodness yourself to take the time to do this and once you know I'll send this information to Mrs Clark's people down in Limerick and I'll do this so she is there she's uh, in in, in the middle of this web of communications and activity yeah, I think I think the important thing about it is, is that is that communication that Margaret talked about, and she's also asked to you know to send a, a postcard to Eva because the, the communication can't be so you know so overt you know they have to come up with ways in which they're sending these messages. And and I again when I was reading things that she was writing or letters that she was receiving, I was thinking this is a whole other level of interconnection and and contact. When when meetings and come to on meetings are listed in the newspapers. Jenny's attendance, and this continues on when she's in the Senate, is always, she's, she's always an attender. She, she appears at those meetings. She's not somebody who joins an organization to lend her name in a sort of honorary capacity. She's, 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 she's such a worker. She must have had considerable energy and the ability to keep going into the late night, get up the next day and the constant engagement with people. You know, the interest in people, remembering their names, keeping in touch with them. Mm. Know, keeping that movement and you see that with Jenny that's exactly what you have you have this woman who was who people you know flock to 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 support them in any way whether it was through business or with through the through um through the organizations she's a judge in the republican court she's a 
uh, you know, with the, the local government elections in 1920. She's a, a member of Dublin Corporation. And, and what's, what people say about her and Kathleen Clark says in her memoirs, how much she admired her for this. And Kathleen Clark isn't a woman who, who gives praise very often, is no. that she insisted on her signature being accepted in Irish, even though the town clerk uh, re was refusing, but, you know, she got her way. And, you know, that's interesting because it looked like most of the other members were not uh, insisting on that, but she, but she was. Um, so that, that's interesting. And people talk about her as a judge in the Republican courts. I think somebody who would have been able to, as an older woman with vast experience, she would have been somebody ideal, I think, in that kind of role. So she's there in the, again, it's always that civic sense I have of Jenny Wise power. Mm -hmm. That's really where she focuses so much of her energies. And she has, um, you know, in terms, and, and, and you'd know Ali from looking at the, the, the minutes, the different um, subcommittees that she's involved in mm -hmm. and the kind of practicalities of things that she's yeah. interested in, that she is a very practical woman. But at the same time, I find it extraordinary that for six months, the IRA executive uh, had their offices in Henry Street. Mm -hmm. Because again, they were, they, they, you know, that, and this is for a testimony from, from her daughter, um, that, that she, she could do all of these things. The un, and at, at, at the time when the movement was completely underground yeah. and how difficult it was to operate. And they're right in the centre of Dublin doing this. <laughs> and I suppose it's been, you know, active in plain sight so that they weren't yeah. expected to be so outrageous. But it's interesting, as you say, Margaret, that she's part of that shadow state and it's very much on the civic and political side that she's involved in. Um, and while the IRA executive are using her home uh, for six months, um, she isn't doing the gun running or the the um, other work that Common Amman women are doing, but the work she's doing is equally important because it is about constructing that shadow state that, that hopefully then will replace the state they're trying to overturn. Um, and, and that's where her commitment has been in terms of politics from early on through her work in Dublin Corporation and will continue on in then through her work in, in the Senate. So she's very much a political woman as well. Uh, and somebody, as you say, that practicality um, to deliver real impact and real change through her membership of, you know, finance committees and public health committees. And then um, and she's the chairman of the Richmond Asylum, uh, say the, the psychiatric hospital in, in, in Grange Gorman. Um, and so she, you know, she continues her work throughout this period as a very practical politician, putting her energies into um, on Dublin Corporation for the people of Dublin and then through the Republican courts, uh, for the people of Ireland. and You know, did she hide guns or did she take messages or did she do, do all of those things? I think that we don't have the evidence to suggest that she did any, you know, any of those activities. Although when she lists the activities that were undertaken during common, uh, the period of the, 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 the Black and Tan War, she does actually list all of those things as activities yeah. undertaken by the organisation. And I think one of the things that, that, um, that it is at the time is that it's that, I, I, sense, I sense that she is a practical woman, so if there was anything to be done at that moment and she needed to do it, she'd just do it herself uh, or get on with it. But I think what sometimes it's the, this idea that, one, we want to bring across that, that she was somebody who was already, you know, at, acting at that level. And, and you know, the, the, she could see the vision of what they wanted to achieve um, in a way. And then some other members would only have been looking at what activity they were doing, like the, the actual moment. But the fact that she mixes the IRA um, and, their, and their headquarters in that place is an indication of that level of, um, of, of IRA intelligence and um, activists and operatives that we know that they are now. So, but a lot of the time in the records that were re retained, we don't see that. And I think Nancy um, is the one that we can see that 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 she has um, she has that role as well. And I don't I, 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 there's no indication that her mother was not supportive of that or that that she said that there was that division that happened because of the activities. So it seems as if there's a, a unity in their activities at this time. So, so I think that that's that's a key point to keep in mind.